Genia. I'm a, a, I work at the Bula, and I'm going to talk about uh, serving the deep uh, models. And by serving, it's a very broad definition. I'm just going to talk about putting them in a server. So in general, it's an architecture talk. So uh, it's going to be like uh, finding some things that uh, I think are important. Uh, from two perspectives, from the data science perspective and from an engineering perspective, then some design considerations, then showing a, a concrete implementation and maybe some numbers. Okay. So before we start, just so I could kind of calibrate uh, the talk, uh, can you please raise your hand if you're more on the kind of data scientist, algorithms, uh, whatever analyst side of things? Right, okay. And on the kind of engineering, uh, data engineering, one of those. Okay, both. Okay, neither. Yeah. MBAs maybe, or like people, like graphics designers. Okay, cool. Um, so about, I would say about half and half, and half the people are both, so that's cool. Um, I'm going to start with maybe talking a bit about myself so you could maybe calibrate what my biases should be or like what my assumptions are and take what I say with a grain of salt. So what the bullet does is recommendations. So the main problems that problem that we solve is recommendation. We usually under articles, we need to quickly pick uh, one of the items that we can recommend that relate to who you are, to the content and uh, to what's best for us, right? So it's a large scale recommendation system. And the way we work is that we have a team that does both. So uh, everybody on the team is both uh, the algorithms uh, guy and the engineering guy. So that might color my perspective. I'm going to talk from both sides, or but they're both sides of kind of the same person. So I might be biased to working together or something like that. Cool. So just to present a problem, usually when we're trained as data scientists, we talk about an offline flow. All of the papers, or at least most of them, certainly in, the, in academia, look like that. So you train a model, then you have like a holdout set or something like that. Uh, or maybe you submit your uh, algorithm somewhere to like Kaggle, and then you look at the results. If they're bad, you uh, change your model, right? Everything is done locally. And uh, this is your kind of benchmark to whatever you're doing is uh, right or wrong, okay? Uh, now, I would try to convince you that you can and should go online. So, um, as a data scientist, what does online mean? As an engineer, I think it's obvious, right? If your system is online, you would use an online system for it, right? If you need to answer uh, to do, uh, I don't know, a parse voice commands and you need to do it on the phone, then your system will run on the phone and will parse the voice commands. But as, an, as a data scientist, I would try to convince you that you probably should use online metrics as well. So uh, the easiest uh, situation where you should is when your model only means anything online. So in recommendation systems, it's kind of meaningless to talk about a recommendation system offline. What would it even mean to have 95% accuracy in a recommendation? But every time you have like an assistant or some system that gives the user input and reacts to it, very hard to look at it offline or meaningless. And every time you generate something, so like art generation or if you do like, uh, if you do style transfer in an Android app, so how would you test it offline, right? You want to see what users do, and that's the only thing that matters to see if your model is good. But even if your model makes sense in an offline context, so like even if you could run through all of your transactions and, uh, I don't know, flag them as a good transaction or risky transaction, you probably should go to online metrics because other things matter, uh, things that are outside your model matter too. So customer satisfaction or some uh, maybe performance metrics or some other derivative metric from your model is probably something you should look at and take into consideration when you're building your model, okay? So your new flow as a data scientist, if you use something like that, is that you first train, then to see the result you need to deploy, then you need some kind of online metrics system and then you look at those metrics and only then you can see what you should do with your model. So schematically. All right. 
So for data scientists, I'm going to give a simple example. We'll use this flow uh, throughout the, uh, the talk. So if we're going to do tabula in a very, very simple way. So the example would be, we would take the title of each item we want to recommend and only look at the hour, like the hour of the day. And we will use that. We put that in some deep model. I don't know, some whatever fully connected uh, network or an RNN or stuff like that. And we will use these two features to predict the click probability. So you would say, I don't know, buy shaving razors and it's uh, 7.30 a.m. And it will tell you, you have a... Uh, 1,000 of a percent probability to click, and if it's something else, it would give you a higher percent, right? It's a very simple model. I'm sure you could find all kinds of problems with it. Nobody would run with it in production, but that's, a, but that's our example. Then if we have a model like that, we can look at all of our items, and we could apply the model, rank it by the probability to click, uh, and then show the items with the highest probability to click. Probably the simplest thing we can do. Then we can report the time and date and maybe the title and if items were indeed clicked. So now we could compare our model to say the model that recommends something randomly, which just an intuition, which would be better, this model or a random model? Nobody? Okay. I would actually guess the random model, but I really don't know. I think the random model would give more diverse things, right? This model will probably show the same thing every hour. It can't know how many times you've seen this item. So it probably so show the same things and a random model would be the same, but I don't know, right? I would want to actually show it to users and see what happens. Cool. So one thing we already kind of see is that now that you have an online flow that you need to do something in order to design your experiments, right? There is a discipline for data scientists and for actual scientists. Uh, called experiment design, right? You should think about what you want to test and you need to design your experiment in order to test the thing that you want to test. So for example, for online stuff, uh, even like our simple model, time frames matter, right? If I want to compare two different models and one of them recommends based on time, I need to show the same amount in each hour. Otherwise I'm biased to wherever I have more traffic and my, uh, and my estimate is not fair. Um, I probably want some stickiness, right? So if I show, if I recommend using different models to the same user, then it kind of defeats the purpose. I don't know, maybe he didn't like the previous recommendations and now everything he does with a new model doesn't matter. So I want some maybe system that for a certain amount of times sticks the user to one experiment. And there is a lot of planning involved in, in planning how much traffic I need to give ex each ex experiment in order to be confident that I really do see the difference that I uh, want to see. So for example, if everything I show is completely independent and my distributions are not in any way skewed, then I could do like a, whatever, as many examples as I need for a t-test. But in real life, I probably, my distribution are skewed and everything uh, probably has dependencies. So I need to learn whether I need to show uh, 100,000 clicks or a million clicks until I can differentiate two models within 1% of uh, click-through rate difference or something like that. So that also requires planning and that limits the amount of experiments I have and limits um, uh, and maybe prolongs the time that I want for the experiment. Anyway, it's work. It's something you need to think about. And one maybe final point that has a lot of uh, impact on the engineering is that often you want experiments fixed in terms of traffic. So think about it, if you have like a default experiment and every time you add a new experiment, your default one gets smaller, then it's no longer a fair comparison because the traffic changes over time. So yesterday you had 10% uh, traffic in the day for default experiments, but today you have only five and then you're biased toward yesterday. So stuff like that, you need to think about it and you need something concrete in your system that allows you to take your planning and bring it to the actual serving system. So to kind of summarize or uh, give names to things that we want as data scientists from the serving system, we would like to see a concurrency would like to run a lot of experiments, probably like, uh, I don't know, one per person on the team, but probably more. Um, we would like throughput, but in the data science sense. So like if you were a lab, you would probably want to use every data point to its utmost uh, 
to decide on some question, right? To answer some question. Is this experiment better? Is, uh, are, do demographics matter? Or something like that. So you, as a data scientist, you kind of look at the traffic as a series of experiments and you want to use the most out of it. Every time you waste traffic, you kind of wasted questions that you could have answered. You obviously want visibility, so if all of those experiments happened but you didn't know about it or you can differentiate them or you can track all of your explaining variables and isolate them, then it's not as useful, so you want visibility. And you want reliability. One thing that we don't think a lot of about as data scientists and things all think it breaks, but if the system broke and your using, users didn't get uh, the answers or something like that, then all of your experiments during that time frame are kind of skewed. So this is something that we as data scientists want. Now, you could look at it from an engineering's perspective. Now, if it wasn't a deep learning system, even if it wasn't, you would have a similar kind of loop, right? You usually, let's say you deploy a database or something like that in a system where scale matters. You would probably configure it, I don't know, decide on how many cores it runs, where it runs, how the traffic is routed, stuff like that. Then you would deploy it which could be complex and could be a whole procedure. And then you would look at all kinds of metrics and decide whether it's good or where you need to change something. And then you might redeploy it or change your solution or do something else, right? Now here also you have complexity. It's not a trivial task, right? You have decisions to do. And I think for deep learning, two main uh, components of this is that it's very hard to understand how many resources you need Right? Because deep learning systems are complex. They depend on a lot of things. Uh, for example, if you have, I don't know, like an RNN or something like that, it really depends on how many words you have in the actual sentences that you put in your network. So if you have a network that's part RNN and part something else, now you depend in a very nonlinear, complex kind of way on your inputs. Uh, but it also depends on like, if you have experiments, usually they don't cater to exactly the same traffic. So let's say you have a Japanese language model, right? So this model is probably uh, shown mostly to Japanese users who have their language break at completely different times. So even as an engineer, I'm looking at my traffic, per experiment, uh, traffic could really differ. And also uh, what my network actually does. And in general, it's hard to understand, given the input, what would the performance be. So that's something we need to think about a lot. But more than we need to think about it, we probably need to test it. We need to show things, send traffic, look at metrics, blah, blah, blah. And this is a complex thing. It's part of our like work. It's not a thing you do once and then leave. Another thing is that even as engineers, we, as if we're working on deep learning or any kind of machine learning, but with deep learning, it's uh, more pronounced for reason we'll see later, we work in an environment where we have a lot of experiments and these experiments kind of define how our system works. So anytime you want experiments to be part of your serving system, you need complex deployments. So what I said before about having the models run in the same time frame, something needs to do that. Something needs to guarantee that your models are actually getting traffic during the same time frame. Otherwise the experiment is skewed. Okay? Or often you have something that learns the model each time using fresh data. So these things need to be bulletproof. Otherwise, if one model is less fresh than the other one, then the experiment is kind of not fair in a way that's really hard to detect. So you need to have all of your system to kind of account for that. And usually you have this kind of relationship between the default, the thing that you consider your system like its default mode, some experiments that are running that you treat differently, that uh, maybe are, it's not as bad as they, if they fail or something like that, or maybe need different metrics. And you almost always need to debug stuff. So just put the system in the way of your uh, like flow and see if it works. And that's a completely different thing because that might break, and, but it doesn't even get traffic, so it shouldn't trigger metrics or whatever. So all of this requires the system itself for the engineer to support those kinds of decisions and give the ability to do these kinds of things. So to sum it up, as an engineer, usually we would want good latency and throughput, but in the kind of classical sense, quick answers and a lot of them given the hardware. And we would uh, like reliability in the sense that the system actually works and serves our users. 
and we would like visibility in the engineering sense. So what's running, where is it running, does it work, how much resources it takes, okay? So I actually didn't mention uh, customers and like business people, but obviously we do want customers to get answers to uh, requests, uh, but I'm putting some of it in the engineering hat and some of it in the data science hat. But so for Tabula, it's the same people, but obviously we're working together. We'd like a system that allows both camps to uh, make their decisions and uh, benefit from whatever it is that they need to do. So if we split those, we can look at two kind of groups of requirements. One part is things that contradict. So there's no way around it. If I want to have a lot of experiments, it would be potentially a slower system and definitely a more complex system than a system that ju just does one thing all of the time and never gets redeployed, right? That, that's kind of obvious, right? If I split my traffic to 25 experiments, which I deploy 50 times a day, it's much harder to allocate resources, to think things work, and so on. Also, if I experiment quickly, uh, I probably would have a harder time keeping latency budgets, right? Because somebody could add five more layers or send bigger input, and then I'm off. So this is something you need to prioritize. It means that you need to make decision about which is more important, how many experiments I can run, how many things my uh, budget allows, and so on. If you're the same person, you need to uh, prioritize it inside or as a team. If it's different people, you need to be able to talk about it. Other things are things that are kind of the same, right? You want visibility, you probably want your visibility efforts on the engineering side to be translated to your data science side, right? So if as a data scientist I have a big uh, everything in BigQuery or somewhere else, and uh, I can look at it and really slice and dice it, probably I would want the same stuff for the engineering uh, department or for the engineer in me. I would kind of like to use the same tools. And if I have, uh, I don't know, Grafana or something like that for my performance graph, I would probably want it for accuracy as well or for revenue or for something like that that I track as a data scientist. Like, if I could do it, it's great. I guess we could at least agree on that. So one thing that we do, uh, and I think is more general than the specific system that we implemented, is we think about those experiments or those serving systems. We call them variants. But basically, it allows us to have one name for the whole thing. So what is the whole thing? It's your training configuration, is how you train your model. That's basically kind of defines the model, as we will see. It tells you how you deploy it. So when you deploy the model, you give it the same name. So you could talk about the model that you train. It would still be the same when you deploy it. And it's also the name that we use for like the service for the actual write, uh, routing. So you would s send your traffic to this model, and it would have the same name. And every time we do reporting or monitoring on everything like that, every time you look at, uh, at the field in Kibana or uh, whatever, or your graph somewhere, they would be keyed by this ID everywhere they are, so we could talk about the same things. A couple examples. Of things you could say. So we have uh, on the right a uh, very simple configuration for the model we talked about before. It's a silly model. It has, for some reason, 32 uh, layers just for looking at the title. And it's not even RNN. It just had absolutely no, like, it's no logic to it. And it has dropouts, even though it's fully connected, blah, blah, blah. It has just two features. And it uses, when we deploy it, we give it 25 cores and 2 gigabytes of RAM, which also doesn't really make sense, but whatever. So we can think about this model, and now we can talk about it. We call it time only fully connected. Now we can say, hey, I look at this model, and it recommends the exact same uh, items all the time, right? Because it can't do anything else. All it has is the time and the title. So even like somebody who's not from the system can Talk about it, for example, whatever, QA, your users, your uh, like board of directors, your customers, whatever, can uh, find out that something is really wrong with your model and tell you about it, okay? Second is you can do engineering configuration, uh, consideration. You could say, yeah, it's too slow. It answers in uh, whatever, more than 20 milliseconds in the 99th percentile, that's not good, do something about it. Uh, let's give it more cores, let's change the model, maybe reduce the, number of layers or something like that. Uh, 
and you can say something about uh, about it in comparison. So it does better, I don't know, it has better revenue or better user satisfaction on weekends specifically. Why, I don't know, but I don't know, maybe weekends are very time sensitive and I would prefer to get the same items, but really, really fit for the time and the random model is not good. Or maybe it just found one thing that it does well each hour and this is a bonanza and everybody clicks it. I don't know, but at least I can talk about it, right? I can compare them. I can look at my metrics and my reporting systems. So now I'm going to talk about how to take these kind of requirements. This was mostly things that we want without any kind of explanation of whether they are possible or not or why those specifically. I'm going to talk a bit about design configuration and what a system like that should look like. And then I'm going to show the actual system that we designed that you might design a different one. So I think the first kind of engineering or design uh, insight is that this is a very good, deep learning in general is a very good microservice because it's kind of textbook example, right? It's just a function. It gets an input, it gives an output, it gives the same output almost all of the time. Um, it doesn't have any dependencies. Right? It doesn't need anything. You can just put it and it will calculate it. And it really scales horizontally, right? You can just, it doesn't matter if you put it on the same machine, on different machine, different cores, just anything like that. You just give it more requests. You spread those requests along more of those things, whatever they are that serve your model, and it works. So, and it has no state, so it's compute only, right? No disks, nothing to coordinate, no, none of that. But on the other hand, it, it's not much more than this microservice, right? You can do much with it once you have your model, once you train it. It's very hard to even validate the outputs, okay? So if you look at the outputs, most models are allowed to return anything. They might have a small range or something like that. You might send it some uh, inputs that you saw before and see that they make sense, but it's not like a real service where you could uh, have some rules about what it should return or some invariants. It just gives you stuff. There's nothing to configure. So even if you see something, you can't really change the model. You need to train it again. So even if you would have found something uh, interesting about it, there's nothing you can do about it. And also there's no real internal state to monitor. So there's no reason to look inside. It just does something, right? Like it's, it just waits in there. So, and as we discussed, the resource footprint is kind of complex, so you need to look at it from the outside, really, right? There's nothing, almost nothing you can look at inside that will tell you how big is it, how much memory it needs. You need to monitor from the outside. So, using these two considerations, it kind of makes sense to package it as a microservice and a very kind of stupid or effortless or like not, without anything smart about it. You just take your model, you put it somewhere, and you don't do much. That's the kind of design we want. So I would argue that almost any deep model has this kind of flow, okay? It starts as a training configuration. It's something that tells you code how to train the model, where to take the data, what layers, blah, blah, blah. Then it takes your data, converts it into a model, then, in our case, we would use a Docker, but it could be a serving something, a thing that can answer questions using your model. And then you would turn a lot of these things uh, and may build a service out of it, something that actually answers requests from your actual users, including your load balancing and your monitoring and all of that stuff. So I'm going to propose a way to do it uh, for each of these steps and then go uh, a bit into the specific technology choices, maybe offer other ones and you could also ask questions later about some of these. So we use TensorFlow. Um, so one good way to, um, uh, to take some configuration and some code and uh, make a model out of it that can answer question is to use TensorFlow. And by TensorFlow I mean anything TensorFlow and above, anything out of the ecosystem. So it could be Keras, it could be your favorite uh, framework, but the kind that does uh, graphs, right? Like, so not necessarily PyTorch or something like that, something that has a serialized model that's not code, okay? Uh, we'll talk about it later, it has advantages and disadvantages, but let's assume we do that. If you do that, then you can save a model and any model that's built with TensorFlow, you could just kind of mechanically serve it with TensorFlow serving. It's not a thing that you do. 
you just run it, right? You put your model, you use TensorFlow serving, you have a service that can answer requests, and we would put it in a Docker, so we have some kind of artifact, some kind of server that we could deploy. And I would suggest to deploy it over Kubernetes, so take a lot of these Dockers and uh, have them deployed as a service together. So this is just an overview. Uh, this is a different slice of that overview. So this is the components part. So what do we really have in a system like that? We'll have training, which is maybe out of scope for this talk, but we train them somehow, probably on GPUs. And uh, these things produce models for us. We have some orchestrator that uh, kind of tells what we should train where, when, and where we should put it. This orchestrator would train the model. After it trained it, it would package it with the code, with TensorFlow serving, and put it on Kubernetes. Two uh, or three uh, key components to actually allow us to use the system is the fact that we need some configuration, right? We need somewhere where uh, directions for our variants on how to train them and how to deploy them would live. Okay, and we must have some monitoring or reporting capabilities. Otherwise, all of our loops are incomplete because we could we could never decide which models to train because all we have are those black boxes and we don't know anything about them. So those are the main components. We need something to orchestrate, somewhere to keep to keep configuration, monitoring, reporting, the usual stuff, and some Docker's running on Kubernetes. Right. So let's look at the training part. So as I mentioned. You should probably use TensorFlow. I recommend using TensorFlow unless you have a very good reason not to or you're living a, like, I don't know, you work on NLP and have to use Dynet, otherwise like nothing you can do would ever compete. I suggest you use something over TensorFlow or spend your uh, time and effort on implementing it in TensorFlow. And I think the best reason for it is that a lot of stuff is there and you can save it in something that is served automatically. Then, after you train your model with TensorFlow, you don't really need to think about what's coming next because all of the production story in TensorFlow is very well developed and not developed by you, which is, I would argue, a good thing. Um, whatever you do, but especially if you use TensorFlow, which has kind of a graph paradigm, so it really needs a lot of configuration, use external configuration. Don't leave configuration in your code. Have somewhere where your variance description lives. And have as much of your graph building code depend on that configuration. The reason is that configuration is easy to look at and code is very hard to look at. It's very hard to find a specific version of the code that ran at this specific instance. And if you put it in a Docker, it lives forever. So if you have some version that didn't work and you need to trace your way back and understand what the code was, it's not fun. But if you had the configuration, you can just print it every time you run and then you know, okay? So in general, what a good configuration model in my opinion would be. So the, I think the most obvious and the biggest part is for it to be descriptive. Like as much stuff that you can tell by configuration, you probably should, okay? As much, so even if you have like a feature flag that you know what it does and it increases dropout to whatever, okay? And you have just two modes, 0 0.3 and uh, 0 0.9 dropout, don't call it low dropout and high dropout, just put the number. Okay, then the next person would find it, understand what's going on. If you could build a configuration system, and I'll show one that does that, it's very helpful to know who did what uh, in order for you to like find them in the hallways and hug them and tell them how what a great job they're doing, but also for you to know whether it was you who broke everything, which is a very important <laughs> thing to know about. Uh, but more seriously, if you have a team and those kind of systems usually make sense in a team context. It really helps to know who did what, who did what when, how do I go back to the version that I understood and knew about, and so on. I would also argue that you probably need hierarchy in your configuration if you're doing experiments. And the reason for that, if you don't have hierarchy, you need to copy everything. But if you want, usually in an experiment, you want to compare two things. And uh, in a hierarchical system, it makes a lot of sense to say, I want to be like this one, except change my dropout rate. Or I want to be like this one, except I want to turn off that feature. So probably any system that 
works for a lot of people or for a big system needs to have some kind of hierarchy supports where you can derive things from experiments. And I really recommend having a thorough system. So for example, at Tabula, when we, for the external configuration system, we don't have get with default, we just have get, okay? Uh, with the assumption that if you use the configuration system, you want to take the thing that's in there, and nobody needs to look at your code. But if you're building a branch or something like that, you could obviously not use configuration. But as soon as it goes to production, as soon as you depend on configuration, you probably want to have it described as much as you can. And, it's, and, this, uh, and this rule takes hold for both your data science stuff, but also for your deployment stuff. So you probably should uh, save how many cores you want to give each variant and stuff like that. If it can point to your code, if you know how to do that, if your system allows for that, uh, and uh, it makes sense if you want to use the like injection stuff, then it, you could also put uh, code in configuration. Not the most important part in my opinion. So we use Spring Cloud Config. I know I'm saying Spring in a Python convention and probably should run away. Uh, so you shouldn't probably use Spring like for anything unless you really want to and know how, but you probably should use Spring Cloud Config. Spring Cloud Config is a great system in the sense that it just gives you a REST service for your configuration. It's, well, if you're in Java and you use Spring, then you need to like uh, do all of your dependencies and hook up profiles and do apps and blah, blah, blah. But if you're in Python, all you need to do is put your configuration in Git, then you have like a URL when you give it the profiles and it gives you the result back in JSON, okay? But it's reliable, it's really a battle-tested application, and it has all the bells and whistles that you probably would forget to write in your own configuration system. So it does like um, a multiple profiles with inheritance, and the inheritance is dynamic, so you could give the profiles in every order, and it has like dynamic profile loading, so you can say inside your profile that you want to load a different profile dynamically. And because it works with Git, so it automatically gives you like audit law, uh, and uh, you can work with branches, all of that good stuff. Very simple to set up. And then you just throw your YAMLs. On the right, I put a couple of examples for our case. So um, some stuff that I maybe didn't mention, but obviously you need your graph stuff and then, uh, the fact that you need 32 layers, but you probably want to say how many cores you need in Kubernetes, or if you have dynamic uh, scaling, you would want to have the minimum and the maximum and how many pods and how many cores and what's the lower limit and the upper limit and stuff like that per variant, and you w might want to maintain it. And you probably want all of your schedule to live there as well for your orchestration. So like, if I want to have two models using the same data, I would want to write it in configuration, have the orchestrator do this automatically for me. And then I could look, okay, what was the input configuration for this variant? Or what was the deployment configuration for this one? Next step is to package it. This thing is simple if you use TensorFlow. Again, I think that because models are really such like almost perfect black boxes, you wouldn't want this part where you take your model and make a server out of it to be complex. You would want it to be automatic. If you use something that's TensorFlow-like, this step really is automatic. You save your model, you do app get install or your ferret packet manager install, TensorFlow model server, give it the port, run it, and you have a gRPC server actually serving your model. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to compile the code. You don't need to know C++ or any other language, really. You just need the model. But if you do want to consider uh, or compare serving system, it's a pretty good one. It's well written. We've, we've extended it a bit, so it really is easy to extend if you want to. Um, it uses very good foundation, so gRPC is a great foundation for that, and HTTP2 is a great foundation for doing these kinds of services. And uh, now that we're in 2018, it actually has good load balancer support, so if you want to balance it with whatever, HA proxy or whatever it is you're doing, and send requests to different uh, models, then you could easily do it. And they also have like crazy stuff like automatic batches and stuff like that where you send requests one by one and it batches them and like wait only 10 milliseconds and then batches together and gives all of the results. It's a really good system. I highly recommend it. But 
any uh, kind of framework would have it. You could do it with Cafe or something like that. If you go the PyTorch, Dynet, all of the dynamic frameworks way, you would need to write something like that on your own. I highly recommend you to stick with this approach where you just take your model and do, don't do anything smart with the data. So TensorFlow, for example, has um, hash tables that you can put inside your model. So if you want lookups, use that. Probably don't put hash tables in your serving code. And there are a lot of stuff like that. If you need to just parse a string, just do it inside your model. It has a lot of advantages. Now to deploy it. So I think putting it in a Docker is a no-brainer. You just put it, put your model, put your uh, server, do um, TensorFlow serving run. How would you turn it into a full service? So a full service is something that can answer a lot of questions, that has monitoring, that has deployment, that has load balancing, that has, all, that has some scaling story, that has some a deployment story, things like that. So in general, even if you don't use Kubernetes, I think it's very, very hard to do a lot of experiments in deep learning without some kind of containerized deployment system. So if you use Amazon and you want to put uh, your servers on, uh, I don't know, make each one an image, do that. But I don't think you can do really run 30 experiments, each getting the same traffic, if you need to SSH into a server and remember which experiment you're deploying. Like, th there's no way that would work. And you need to scale. If you don't have some kind of automatic scaling or some, some sort of smart scaling, then it's very expensive to have experiments. So every time you split your 10% traffic experiments into two 5% traffic experiments, if you don't also split their resources, you're wasting a lot of cores, and that really limits you. So you need some kind of, whatever, dynamic or smart or some kind of logic to do your resource allocation. And the smarter it is, the more experiments it allows you to do. Uh, over time or over variance. Also, it's very hard in, uh, when you're rolling your own system to have the kind of monitoring support that you need. So you would probably want to look at one specific uh, model running on real traffic, but it would be distributed, and you would want to see how efficient it is uh, every time you deploy it. So you need like very granular monitoring. But you would also want your pager duty to, I don't know, to ping you at night if you deploy too many models and don't have the core. So you need some kind of very coarse monitoring. Rolling all of that out is a fun engineering task, maybe, I don't know, but it's very hard. So any system that gives you a good containerized deployment story is a good system. You could use Nomad, we did. You could use uh, Amazon, you could use Google Container Engine. If you have the ability and the DevOps resources, I really recommend Kubernetes. Why Kubernetes? In Kubernetes, a lot of those things are out of the box. So obviously, it's possible to have dynamic scaling. Most of us have written some kind of dynamic scaling at some point in our lives. But it's very easy in Kubernetes. You tell it, I want this thing to be at 75% CPU utilization. This is the minimum. This is the maximum. Go do that for me. It's easy. It has its own service discovery. It has pluggable load balancers. So if you just want to kind of send your traffic somewhere and have it go to the right experiment based on its variant name, it's super easy in Kubernetes. You don't need to put like console or roll out your own. It has all kinds of very high level deployment primitives. So if you want to do like blue green deployments and have your new model uh, serve a, a little bit of traffic and only replace the old one if it's good, it's very easy. It has like liveness and readiness tests. So you could define stuff to see if your model behaves correctly. And um, two things that I think don't get enough attention in these kinds of systems, but are very important is it has a good UI. So you could really just click edit on your service and press, I know I now want something else. I want a different Docker. I want more cores. I want something uh, different. And it updates in real time. So I don't think you could do it anywhere else. And somebody actually maintains this UI. And unlike something you would roll on your own, uh, it has pretty good networking support. So uh, one of the biggest problems with doing stuff uh, like serving with a lot of different variants is you need to manage ports and you need to do NATs and you need to know which port is uh, for which service. Kubernetes has good routing support. If you configure that, each of your Dockers is just a machine. You could SSH to it, you could ping it, you could do anything like that. 
hard to explain why it's so cool until you try it, but believe me, if you try drawing one, it's very important. So to sum up in general, before we do some like really nitpicky tips kind of stuff, you train your model with TensorFlow. You put it in a container uh, with uh, TensorFlow serving. You put it on Kubernetes. You give it some real traffic. Then you look at your online metrics. If you did the whole boilerplate correctly and it works, most of your work gets back to doing like one and five. Training the model, looking at metrics, training the model, looking at metrics. Time frames get a little bit longer. Probably you would like to look, you would need a day of traffic or something like that. Depends on how much traffic you have. But it's the same experiment and you get back to Python, which is what we probably would like to do anyway. Now a few small things that I kind of mentioned briefly but weren't exactly aligned with the story that I would like to quickly cover before I uh, head to questions. One thing that I lied a little bit about is the fact that the uh, models are complete boxes, black boxes. They're not in the sense that they do have a schema, right? They do have accept some inputs and output some outputs and need certain shapes, otherwise they break in very weird and unexpected ways. And they might expect stuff like padding and stuff like that. So you do need to manage that if you, uh, if you can manage that. And I think one way that we found that's very useful, especially if you do TensorFlow serving, is to manage it like a protobuf schema. So just don't remove stuff and it will be okay. So every time, uh, for us, for example, each family of models reads all of the features. It just doesn't do anything with them. It doesn't complain if it got a feature that it doesn't need. And we, uh, so the system can kind of send the same requests to each model, whether they use the features or don't. And we know that we only add features, so a newer model will always work with old data, so we <coughs> could always test it and compare it, uh, even if it's not the other way around. It's really very similar to the protobuf story, and it makes sense because TensorFlow serving is just gRPC. If you really, really, really need deprecation, you could deprecate. Protobuf has a Stoodle deprecate, put it there, have all of your uh, data scientists and engineers not use the feature and not feel it. One of the great things about Protobuf is they can always just not feel a field. It's always legal. Just have your model, read it, and then ignore it. So that solves one problem. And I think it's a good solution mainly because it kind of ignores it and gets us back to the black box story. If you want to do complex stuff with schema, you can. I don't recommend it. It's very hard in a large team. Another thing is that pr you probably know that uh, if you want to look at model performance, it's not really a black box. You probably have some idea about what the model does, whether it does um, matrix multiplications or uh, embedding lookups or your uh, uh, whatever, your CNNs are slow or your RNNs are slow. So if you really want to look at that kind of granularity and even if you want to do it in, on real serving systems, you can just enable tracing. Actually, you could enable tracing on just one request if you want to. It's one of the... Um, well, you need to adapt TensorFlow, surf, well, sorry, TensorFlow service a bit, but it's, it's, a session, it's a session feature in TensorFlow. So you can just trace one request if you really want to. And then you get something that can, you can see in the UI and you can see concurrency and you can see what's taking most of the times and do things like that. It's not supported out of the box in TensorFlow Serving, but it is supported in TensorFlow Python. And it's not really a big change in TensorFlow Serving to support it. You just need a bit of C++ knowledge. Last thing is, I didn't talk about like tabula scale or stuff like that. I'm only going to talk about this specific system. Uh, so you could decide whether it's something that's roughly in what you're trying to do. So we've been running this for quite a long time. I think in this iteration for a year, maybe. Mm. And in some other iterations for a year and a half. So it's a relatively large system engineering wise, which is the left part. So it has a lot of, it does a lot of requests and it does them around the world. We run on our own hardware and does them quickly. But no less important is the right part where we're a fairly large group. A group now, we're almost 40 people. 
And we do periodic models because that's the kind of models that recommendation does. So we need to train models every day. So we managed to train about 60 in about four different algorithms. So it means we run a lot of experiments. And so far, it worked great for us. So if it wouldn't work well, then data science probably wouldn't use it or do something else that works around this whole experiment co uh, concept. But they slash we still do. So I think it works well. Question. Right, so the question was whether other frameworks provide the same services. So I would separate it to two different questions. One is higher level frameworks that work with TensorFlow. Obviously, if you do whatever, Keras, Donut, stuff like that, everything that works on top of TensorFlow, every kind of graph-based framework that uses TensorFlow, yes, it works the same. You just save the model, it works, no problem. If you use something that's dynamic and that's the I don't know, maybe you're using Cafe. Anybody using Cafe here? I used to in the past. Right, so if you're using Cafe, you know what to do, use Cafe. But if you're not using Cafe and you're not using TensorFlow, you're probably using some dynamic framework. You're using PyTorch, you're using Dynet, something where Python itself kind of guides you through the flow, right? So where you don't produce a model. There, the, a, pro, the serving story is not as fun. You usually need to deploy code together with your model. You need to know what the version is. You might need to think about Python optimization, not always, but usually. So that's kind of my opinion on that. You still could do it, but it's just more work. The question was whether it's because of the tooling. It's not only the tooling, although TensorFlow has great tooling. It's just the fact that in TensorFlow you produce a graph once and then run it. There's no Python running when your code run, so it's inflexible in that sense. You can't build your model dynamically and do those things. You need to hard code these things into a model, but deployment story is very easy because your serialized model is the model. You don't need code. So it has its ups and it has its downsides. Other questions? Okay, so the question is, uh, how do they manage everything, probably everything on to the left of what I covered here. So like inputs and stuff like that. So it's a long story. Uh, I don't think I can cover it here, but we try to use the same configuration there as well. We consider it as like one aspect of the variance. So really we define variance by two keys, the input uh, variant and the model variant, and we do it like that. In terms of technologies, it's a long discussion, like how do you manage and how do you version it? But I think if you manage to build your system on top of the same configuration, then it's easier. You could do your experiments kind of the same way. Also, you probably need to put all of your pre-processing stuff into the same orchestrator. So you need the one central place that does your pre-processing, training, deployment, yeah, and you have such systems, centralized system that is used by all data scientists, or every data scientist uses its own. So I wouldn't say everybody uses it. It's pretty democratic. You could decide not to use it, but I think most do because it's very useful. But if we're talking about the full thing from input to deployment, it's something you need to home grow. I don't, I don't know of a solution that does everything to you, uh, to you, for you, uh, uh, at the same level of quality that TensorFlow serving serves model. You could try use something like whatever. Beam, Spark, something like that. There's no very, very consistent story that takes you from data to deployment. And I think it's hard to make one, but that's just my opinion. Other questions? Yeah. OK, so the question is, do we do deployment on GPUs? We don't. Our models don't benefit from it. We do training on GPUs and deployment on CPU. But Kubernetes now has kind of native support for GPU resources. The only limitation is that you have to use the full GPU. You can't have like 0 0.3 GPU. So you have to give each Docker a full GPU. But other than that, if you benefit from it in serving, go for it. We don't. For us, it's not useful. So the question is whether a user who has used Taboola for a while, would we see improvement in uh, click-through rates? It's a good question. I'm not sure I would agree with the characterization that everything is a clickbait. I think most people who don't use the system, like me, uh, not, don't use the system a lot and don't have a lot of information, will probably see a lot of the more kind of shallow things, pretty much like your YouTube recommendations when Google doesn't know about you, it's usually very sensational stuff. But 
I think a person where we have quite a bit of information on would probably get better recommendations. And the reason, the only way I can convince you of that is that we actually do that. If it wasn't the case, we probably wouldn't recommend different things to different users, right? We wouldn't have a personalization system if it wouldn't be effective. Okay, so the question is, do we have different models or just different variants of the same model? So uh, we, we have four or maybe five now different, what you would call a model or model families, things that are completely different, like have different inputs and different purposes. So for example, something that does text analysis to decide uh, what's a good exploration target, what we should uh, focus on when we only see the item as at first and maybe which only has the text and the image and blah, 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 because we didn't show it yet. And maybe a different system that does personalization, those are completely different models. They would have different everything, different inputs, output, and so on. So we have about four or five of these, and the 60 models that we train every day are the variation of these. So some of them are uh, maybe more mature and have more people working on them, and they might have like 30 different things that we are trying at once. Some of them would be bigger, some would have like 5% traffic, some of them have, would have 1% traffic, some of them are very specific to some site or some user segment and stuff like that. But uh, it's 60 of four or five different types. And uh, follow-up question, do they, do they all sit on the same architecture you spoke about, the, the design, or do you have like... <clears throat> so all of our models, uh, I wouldn't say all of our models, but all of our models from this kind of family or use this. We have lose odds and ends from other systems that use their own stuff, but even they use roughly the same philosophy. Uh, all of those 60 or four use specifically this architecture. So the same training pool, the same serving pool, same uh, configuration, stuff like that. Okay, so the question was, does this uh, such a setup would allow uh, stopping a model without restarting service? So to, to upgrade the version. So there are two ways to do it. Um, if you use Kubernetes, that's just, that's almost free. You just uh, override the current deployment, tell it I want to deploy it, it creates a new, they call it a replica set, and you can define when this replica set, uh, under what criteria it rolls back and under what criteria it uh, changes, and then it kind of gradually migrates uh, uh, pods from one to the other. If you don't use something like Kubernetes and you want big servers with TensorFlow Serving, TensorFlow Serving has its own versioning option where you put things in folders of called like one, two, three, four, and then you can even at the request time, but also in different ways, uh, decide which version runs and they have all kinds of settings of how many models to load together and stuff like that. So if you want to go that way, you could, but obviously Kubernetes is much more flexible. Yes, somebody asked to elaborate more about Spring Cloud Config in a Python conference. That's amazing. So let's go back to Spring Cloud Config. So Spring Cloud Config is just a server you put uh, YAML or JSON, and YAML is basically a superset of JSON, so you could put JSON and call it YAML. Um, you put it in uh, files, like on the file system in Git. You call them app name minus profile name, and you put your configuration here. Here I prepared specifically for the talk, but this is what it looks like. You just do a hierarchy in YAML or something like that. And then you configure the server to look at your Git repository and it gives you a REST interface. It looks something like my server slash branch slash application slash profile name separated by commas dot JSON and it just gives it, gives it back to you after applying all of those rules. So except that it works and you need to learn a bit about the uh, it's a simple pro project to deploy. And then you just push to Git and it works. So inheritance in Sprint Cloud Config works by the fact that you give it multiple profiles and it, if the new, the profile that comes after, the, like I have profiles A and B and they contain the same property, the second one would override. That's the simplest, but there are more complex ways to do it. Can I ask profile B to Yes, you could also ask Profile B to import Profile. 
they have imports, they have, uh, they have inheritance this way, but they also have dynamic inheritance the other way. And you can reference other settings with like dollar and curly braces. So it's a full configuration system. People use it for like big Java stuff. So it, it's, it really is just a server for what is really spring configuration, which is a time tested, super kind of engineering heavy, rather pretentious system. So. You could just use it for simple stuff, it would be. I don't know about I, I I know people trying to roll their own. I never find a, a system like that in the Python world. It's a shame because it seems like a great fit, but I don't know a system that has really this kind of... There are obviously ways to, I don't know, put any files in a Python server, and there are a lot of projects like that, but a really robust uh, configuration system, yeah. I don't know of. Um, I know Facebook have their own, obviously Google have their own, big companies roll their own. I'm not aware of something open source specifically in the Python world, but again, you really don't need one. Just use this one. It's as Python-y as anything else, it just runs Java behind it. Thank you.